Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of uh, speaking with Allison today. Allison, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Allison Jacobs, and I am currently a high school math teacher, but that is not everything that I've done. Before I started teaching math, I worked in the business industry for about 16 years. I worked in the oil and gas industry. I was called a engineering analyst or an engineering technologist. And my role with those companies that I worked for, I worked for about five or six, was to run all of our economic data into specific programs. We would forecast and predict how much oil and gas each of our wells would produce. And then we would take that and figure out, well, how much money is that going to make us? And then share that information with stockholders and things like that. So that's kind of the job that I used to hold. During pandemic, I decided to do something different. And so that's how I wound up being a high school math teacher. But uh, I really enjoyed my time in the industry, made all sorts of interesting connections with people all over the world and really enjoyed that time. Very cool. Welcome. Uh, I'll dive right in with the questions, the first of which being, to what extent have quantitative literacy and or general problem solving skills that you might pick up in a math course, for instance, uh, to what extent have they contributed to your personal or professional success? Yeah, so I think the biggest one for me is going to be quantitative literacy. And the, the the biggest part of that was being able to spot things that are wrong, right? You have a general sense of how things are supposed to add up at the end. And if suddenly you're off by, you know, three decimal points because you were supposed to end up with 10 million and now you have 10,000, you've clearly done something wrong somewhere, right? And so being just comfortable with knowing what to expect and then noticing that that's not what you got so that you can go change whatever you did, right? The, the, the programs that I always used were doing the heavy lifting of the calculations for me, but I still had to know the right way to use them and be comfortable with knowing what to expect and feeling confident that the answers that I was giving to people were generally close enough to write that I wasn't making a big mistake. The other thing with that is just things like checking data. You know, I wasn't the person that was inputting the daily data for wells, but if I see something that's, you know, 3000 on a day that I'm expecting 30, I have to say, well, was somebody just wearing really thick gloves? Or was the well just like, oh, wow, we had a miracle today, you know, and so just recognizing what kinds of number errors can happen and being comfortable and confident with fixing them, uh, things like that were really useful to me in that career. Another part that you asked about was problem solving. And actually, this is something that I teach to my high school geometry students all the time. I'm teaching proofs, right? And I say, I know that when you get out into the real world, no boss is going to say, hey, can you prove that this triangle is congruent to this triangle in a mathematical proof, right? That's never going to happen. Okay, but what is going to happen is somebody's going to say, hey, we have this information. We need to know this information, and I need to figure out how we can get from here to here. And so part of my job being comfortable with problem solving was what would be those logical steps to connect this for the people that I'm working with? What kind of things can I pull from other sources or things that I knew in the back of my brain to get from one point to another without feeling defeated? And sometimes that works really well. You know, I can go out and I can say, oh yeah, I've solved this problem and it was super easy. But most of the time it required what I would call thinking walks. And I would literally take my lunch and I would go walk around downtown for 20 minutes. And the walking helps me problem solve and think, even if I'm not directly thinking about that problem, sometimes just walking away can help and having that perseverance to say, it's okay. 
that I didn't solve this one within five minutes. I may not solve it this week, but I'm going to keep thinking about it until I come to a solution. And so having that perseverance can really, it, it certainly helped my professional success. I had a lot of people that I mentored that would give up and come to me right away. And, you know, you could just tell that they weren't going to be as successful in the industry because they didn't have the perseverance to s- spend time thinking about it. I'm definitely going to borrow the the phrase thinking walks. So that's the first time I've heard <laughs> it. I, I've, I've shared with my own students that, you know, when I was in graduate school, we had these really tough abstract algebra and, and analysis courses that are dealing with things that are entirely imagined. And sometimes they'll come back to earth. But in both courses, we had these very tough final exams. For my algebra course, I remember distinctly solving one of the final exam questions while I was driving home. So I had to, you know, steer into a gas station somewhat safely, uh, take notes because I, the, the solution was going to sort of vanish. So uh, yeah, I guess in my own way, I was going on a thinking walk, but that's <laughs> just a very lovely phrase. Uh, I like thinking th- walks. <laughs> uh Thank you for sharing that. Uh, The next question uh, that comes in mind is, how do you think your professional life would be different, if at all, if you didn't have the same relationship that you currently do with just basic, simple mathematical ideas? So whether it be problem solving or quantitative literacy, whether it's facility with numbers or dealing with abstract ideas, how, how, if at all, do you think your professional life would change or would have changed? Yeah. So let me tell you a little about how I kind of got into what I did. It was one of those moments in life where all of a sudden I was halfway through a graduate program and I was about to get married and we weren't going to have any money because my husband was also going to do a graduate program. And I thought, you know, I really like paying rent and eating. One of us is going to have to get a job. (laughs) And so I had a bachelor's in math and originally I thought I would go into teaching and really just got out of college and thought, you know, I'm 21 years old. I have zero life expect or life uh, experience. How, how am I going to help students? You know? And so I really just wasn't comfortable doing that at that time and decided I'll just search. This was in the beginning days of internet job searches. And so I searched for math. What can you do with math? I kind of like math. And I find this job that says, we want people with math degrees to come apply for this job. And so I went, I was like, I don't really understand anything that the job description said, to be honest. I mean, it was all this jargon. I had never heard of it. I I didn't know what forecasting was. I didn't know what any of this was, but I went down, they had me take a little basic math test and I passed it and they offered me the job. And I was like, okay, that was weirdly easy. And I get into it and it's all building spreadsheets and running numbers and being somehow they had me like programming and I've never programmed in my life, but I had a mindset of wanting to learn. I had a mindset of wanting to, you know, make money and eat. And I had a mindset that I am a smart and capable person. I can do this, even though I keep making mistakes over and over. I had a really tough time transitioning to the working world that first couple of years. And, you know, they, I made mistakes. I wasn't checking my work. Like, you know, we all tell you in math class, check your work, check your work, check your work. I wasn't doing that. I was terrible at that kind of stuff those first few years. And then suddenly it clicked and I was like, I need to treat this different. I need to treat these more as problems to be solved that I am capable of solving rather than he asked for the spreadsheet. So I need to do it as fast as I can and then hand it off. Right. And so switching that in my brain to I'm solving a problem, not I'm turning in something as fast as I can really helped me change that mindset. And then I ended up moving to a different company, which can sometimes help in your professional life because I'd made so many mistakes in that first job that they were just not thrilled. (laughs) And they wanted me to work 60, 70 hours a week. And I was like, I don't actually really like doing that that much. I like having some balance. 
I switched to a company um, that I ended up working for for about 10 years and just loved the culture, loved the change and, you know, really became a leader of our group because not only was I using the math, solving the problems, being comfortable with, you know, how can we, uh, we would have graphs that look like this. Oh, my marker is dying. It's the end of the school year. So, you know, all this data through here and we would make our forecast lines through there. I'll switch markers because they're fun, you know? And so I was comfortable with graphs and data analysis, not in the same way that maybe a data scientist is, but certainly comfortable with using a, mo a data model, right? And that really helped me to, you know, I ended up starting to teach classes to colleagues. I ended up in a different role after that, selling really expensive software and training people on it, along with building SEC reports that were going out to shareholders in the government. So it was all really interesting. And I think I wouldn't have gotten to have those experiences if I hadn't flipped that switch early on in my career of, I'm not just turning in stuff because boss wants it. I'm trying to solve math problems and trying to, you know, figure out what's going to happen in the future. It, it sounds like there was a podcast I, I heard uh, between Steven, Star Steven Strogatz and Grant Sanderson of the three blue, one brown fame, um, hmm. where they were talking about, well, how is it that Steve Strogatz gets, uh, he's a master communicator and, and popularizer of mathematics. Uh, how is it that you get students enthusiastic about learning math? And, and the response he gave was, you have to get them to fall in love with the problem. So that, that's what you were talking. That's what it, it, where it took me that, uh, you know, someone else didn't have to tell you to fall in love with the problem. You turned busy work, as it were. Uh, or sometimes other folks might see it as busy work of, you know, I have a report that I have to fill out or finish and then I have to turn it in. If you turn that into something that you can enjoy tackling, um, just having a different frame of mind can often make things that maybe you don't enjoy turn into more enjoyable things because now you're approaching it as a challenge or maybe with a healthy sense of adventure as opposed to it, it being work. Yeah. Uh, Last question to round out the bend would be, can you think of anything specific, any specific examples or maybe situations that pop in your head where being comfortable with mathematical thinking or again, quantitative literacy helped you tackle and if things went well, maybe even resolve a complex issue that you were dealing with? Yeah, so a couple of specific examples kind of came to mind when you said that. Um, you know, my job was very number centric. I ended up being one of the only people that actually had a math degree in that company I worked for for a really long time. But certainly all of us were using mathematical thinking, even if they didn't have that background. One of the tasks that I really kind of stands out in my mind is we were trying to figure out. So like I said, I did a lot of forecasting what's going to happen in the future and that included everything from how much will <clears throat> the wells produce, how much will we spend to get that to happen, how much will we get paid for that based on the up and down price of oil and gas, which is very volatile. And the one thing that was consistently happening year after year after year was we were consistently under planning how much we were going to spend to get that that oil to produce, right? So every year our operating costs were 10% low. And I'm like, well, it, it's just because that happens, right? Like, can't explain why you can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball. And I was like, no, I really should probably maybe think about this a little bit deeper than flippantly answering, I don't have a crystal ball. That's not really an appropriate business response. So I ended up working actually with our accounting group, which I, we were very separated. The accounting group does the accounting, that's the bills paid and all that stuff. The engineering group is the engineering group. And, you know, 
we're in different buildings for goodness sake. I mean, I, I don't know that I can walk across the field to go talk to them, but you know, I decided I would suck it up and go talk to the accountants. It turns out they actually know stuff, which is great. I had no idea what they knew because uh, I was over in my engineering tower and they're all in their accounting tower. You just you just don't know what everybody knows. And it turned out that we were not accounting for paying people in an office, right? Like all of our all of our fields in various places across the United States had oil workers that would go out to the field and do tests and things like that. We were paying all of those guys. You want to know who we weren't paying? The wonderful office people that were keeping it together and telling us whose schedules and sending us the reports and things like that. Somehow we just missed it, right? But once I could dig in with the accountants and they could show me exactly where all of the money was going each month, we found that it was a super simple fix, but somebody had to make that leap of, you know, recognizing that there's maybe some piece of information that we don't have, like I'm talking about that problem solving earlier, and where could we go to get that, um, and how can we tie it all together? So that ended up being a really good project for me just because it was interesting, but also it helped us really reduce that error that we were making year after year after year. I think ultimately somebody thought that it was included in this particular coded line and I had to kind of convince them, nope, <laughs> you need That's to pay sound, Janine. It, it sounds like a huge either potential savings or even if you're not saving the company money, uh, knowing that it's not some 10% of, of operating budget isn't getting sucked into this black hole that no one can account for is probably a good thing from, you know, the SEC's side as well. That It's 100% a good thing to know because our job was to be as accurate as possible, right? And a shareholder wants you to be as accurate as possible. And so if we're consistently following below, you know, you need to figure out where that is. And it's also helpful to know that nobody's skimming money off the top somewhere that we don't know about. It's helpful to know that we're not just losing equipment out in the field that nobody is accounting for and we're having to buy new pipes or something, you know? It, it ended up making a pretty big impact. It certainly sounds like it. Uh, I, I really, really knew nothing about the field that you shared about and uh, quite enjoyed learning about it. Uh, so thank you so very much for your time and, and being so generous with it. I'm sure the students will enjoy this conversation so much. Yeah, thanks. It was fun. <laughs>